Hey there berries, welcome to my Nautilus Season 13 support guide. I've done other Season 13 support guides on this YouTube channel, so be sure to subscribe if you want to catch the new ones coming out, or have a look at the channel if you want to find out some other support ones that I've already done, such as like Lux, Morgana, Rakan, Milio, Janna, Senna, Brand. We've done a lot already so far, but we've still got more to do. If you're new to my kind of guides, then I like to do them in one take, but we cover everything in one go. We're going to cover everything from runes uh, to summoners to items to abilities, ability skill orders, and how you can kind of use your abilities uh, to do some kind of cool combinations uh, and auto attack cancelling on Nautilus that you kind of need to be aware of, uh, which should also increase your win rates in your games. So first off, we're going to be starting with the runes. Uh, there's two kind of rune sets for Nautilus, but for the purposes of this guide, I want you to focus on the glacial runes that are in front of you right now. So we have the glacial augment. Whenever you immobilize an enemy champion, has a cooldown though, uh, it will put down an ice patch on the ground and it will basically make it so that the enemy champion that's crowd controlled uh, it would make it really difficult for them to be able to move back into a safer location so it puts down these three icy rays on the ground uh, and basically just enhances your crowd control uh, and basically means that the person that you're catching off uh, it means that you're much more likely to get a kill off of that um, the other kind of rune page you could have gone into is Aftershock, which does kind of make you more tanky, but it means that you don't have this kind of catch-kill potential that you have throughout the entire game. I mean, Nautilus can still catch people out with his base kit line, but the Glacial Augment just kind of makes that a lot easier and simpler. Next, we're going to be doing Hextech Flash Traption, and um, I will be explaining this one in the advanced guide if you're not familiar with Hextech hextech flash but essentially this basically means that you've got a flash even when flash is off when it's on cooldown uh, so you're able to use that to get brush pressure during the laning phase in particular that's mainly when you're going to be using your hextech flash traption we're also going to be taking minion dematerializer which is maybe another item that you're not familiar with i'll be going through that in terms of the advanced section as well at the end of the guide uh, minion dematerializer does make it so that you're guaranteed able to secure those kind of minions with your relic shield um, so minion dematerializer still gives you the gold and your ad carry the gold as long as you have that uh, relic shield charge um, but we'll be going to be talking about it more in depth like when you should be kind of prioritized using this uh, in the advanced section cosmic insight is just some general um, summoner spell haste which means that your summoners will be released well removed off cooldown a bit quicker and the item haste plus 10 means that we are going to be picking up um, one or two item uh, actives so that will basically mean that those items come off cooldown sooner also, this affects trinkets as well, by the way, so that's like the oracles as well. Next, we're going to be taking resolve secondaries just because we do need to have some sort of extra help with the tankiness in terms of runes since Nautilus is a tank. Second Wind is a really good option. Uh, Nautilus has a lot of um, base HP, so Second Wind means that you're going to be recovering a decent chunk of your health during laning phase. 4% uh, of your missing health uh, plus 3 over 10 seconds isn't... Um, isn't bad at all and if you do take the occasional chip damage and you kind of hand back a little bit you would have basically shrugged that damage off anyway unflinching is a really really good tanking rune um, essentially it gives you tenacity and slow resistance so basically it means that you're going to be in the crowd you're basically going to be crowd controlled less often which when you're being the first one into the fray uh, can be um you're probably going to be getting hit by some crowd controls at some point and the inflinching just gives you a chance to get out of those bad situations after you've already engaged. Now unusually you may be thinking but we are going to be taking attack speed rune on Nautilus mainly because there is something to do with his auto attacks that we'll be talking about in the ability section that I want to talk about and the attack speed definitely helps out with that and also helps clearing wards because Nautilus attack speed is super slow imagine swinging around a giant anchor in real life it would be it's as slow as that 
We are going to be taking generically six armor and the magic resist rune for some, you know, extra tankiness. If you know exactly what you're going to be going up against team composition wise, say you, you know the whole enemy team is going to be full physical damage, you can do full armor here or vice versa for magic resistance. Um, but generically, if you don't know or just want to not even think about it, armor and the magic resist rune is perfectly fine to do. Next, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going into the practice tool and we're going to be loading up Nautilus. Uh, we also will be talking about the summoners while we do this. So on Nautilus, he has really, really good catch potential in the laning phase or for roaming around the map in general and going for kills generally. When there's kills, there's usually an ignite involved and you'll be taking the ignite. And obviously we have to take the flash because we're going hextech flash traption, but generally on support you're taking flash every single time anyway. So going into game here, that's gonna give ourselves some cash and we're gonna make sure the minions do not spawn. So the first part of this guide inside the actual practice tool is we're going to be talking about items. If you've already played a tank support, then you're probably going to be quite familiar with the item build as tank supports generally buy the same thing. So if you're new to tanks on uh, playing tank supports in League of Legends, once you've kind of done one, the others generally fall suit um, and you could pick these same tank items that I'm going to suggest on a range of different other tank supports such as Blitzcrank or Leona. So first we're going to be picking up the Relic Shield. So Relic Shield basically means that when you get the last hit on minions, provided that you have these charges, which you can kind of see with like the little shield just above my uh, Q, um, you get three potential charges. Also the, these little blue orbs that are kind of floating around me, notice it's so big, you see this orb. As you get more of these uh, charges, you can get up to a maximum of three. Whenever you last hit a minion, um, you'll basically get its gold, but also the nearest person to you also receives the full amount of gold. So generally you're going to want to be using your last hits primarily on cannon minions, but not every single wave has a cannon minion and you're going to be able to have more orbs than there are cannon minions. So you will want to use the other orbs on melee minions to get gold um, because they have more gold value than the caster minions. Generally try and save if you're not really sure how to use this item My advice would be is to try and leave one orb up all the time Just for the case of there being a cannon minion just in case you kind of lose track of the wave state So always try and leave one orb open and ready for the cannon minion Also in the advanced section um, I probably will mention about relic shield usage as well But a good general tip is, is don't use relic shield um, at all um, for the very first wave and try and save it for the second wave because the second wave um, if you kill the entirety of the first wave so that's three melee minions and three caster minions plus if you get three melee minions from the second wave that means you hit level two level two power spike engage is pretty important and you can use two of those charges uh, to kill off the um, two of those three many minions coming into the second wave to help enhance your speed in terms of getting that level two advantage. Going and talking a little bit um, more than what I usually would do with support items, but it's pretty um, important that you understand that when playing tank supports because Relic Shield can be quite confusing for some newer players. Next, we're going to be going straight for a mythic and the mythic I want you to buy is a Locket of Iron Solari. Please don't be trapped into buying the Even Shroud. Even Shroud is an okay item, but Locket of the Iron Solari is just really powerful at the moment and the strongest out of all the tank mythics right now. So Locket of the Iron, Iron Solari gives you a decent chunk of base stats. So it gives you health, ability haste, ma armor and magic resistance, everything that a tank needs. You've also got this mythic passive aura where it grants all other legendary items um, on you, um, more armor and magic resist, and it gives it to you as it, your teammates. The base aura of this is three armor and three magic resistance to everyone inside of this giant blue circle. So it's just a basically a passive way to slowly increase your team's armor and magic resist when they're near you. Now this adds up to quite a, a high amount at the moment because um, a lot of games are ending earlier and generally builds are leaning more towards flat penetration as opposed to a percent penetration. So it being a bit annoying and increasing everyone's kind of base armor and magic resistance up slowly does have a knock-on effect in diminishing some of the damage coming from assassins in particular. 
Also on your relic shield for the completes that counts as a legendary item. So you're going to get one legendary item pretty early on. So that you're going to generally get this aura um, to five armor and five magic resist to anyone near you quite early on, which is really, really nice for everyone um, inside that circle. It's, it's a lot, five armor and five magic resistance. It doesn't sound like it is, um, but it will be negating like half of the, of the lethality item in, in some cases. Um, in terms of boots, um, there's a little bit of a trap in terms of people going mobility boots. So it used to be the case in previous seasons where supports were kind of meant to be roaming around a lot more on the map than they are right now. You can definitely still do that with champions like Nautilus, but I would not advise it with mobility boots. I would definitely be urging you to take something more like the plate steel caps, the mercury treads, or you could even go into some cooldown reduction boots with the ionian boots of lucidity. Generally though, if you're not really too sure, you can't really go too wrong with plated steel caps as there is still a lot of auto attacking things into the game and it's going to reduce that by 12%. A flat 12% reduction is going to be really, really good and it scales throughout the entire game quite nicely. If you know for a fact there's a lot of enemy crowd control and an enemy team, then plus 30% tenacity, you can't really go wrong with that either. So if you know there's just a lot of stuns and stuff coming out of the enemy team, like stuns, slows, taunts, fears, silence, blinds and polymorphs and other immobilizing effects, um, then Merc Tree Treads will be the better option, but generally from the majority of the games I want you to take plated steel caps and lean towards that. Also just a side note, because you know you're generally getting your boots quite early on, ideally you're probably finishing your boots before you're completing a mythic just because your boots are a lot cheaper and movement speed is really really important especially for a hard engaged tank like Nautilus is to find those kind of angles to catch people off. Um, the boots um, yeah, you're just going to want to pick them up as quick as possible and also the plated steel caps have armor. Um, armor also mitigates the amount of damage that you take from minions and turrets so having the extra little bit of armor there from the, on your boots could help you essentially tank an extra shot from the turret in doing a tower dive. From this moment on, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to get money in terms of getting for another item. I know that sounds kind of silly, you've only bought like you got your relic shield, your locket and your boots. But honestly, at this point, it gets very difficult to generate gold playing a tank support. The primary reason is it's just that you're not going to be really getting any kills. And if you do get any kills, it's going to be kind of like more unlucky more than than anything. Um, it's not impossible though, so the longer stages of the game, you have a couple of crazy options. Um, I will say though, it's pretty hard to go wrong since most of the power on a third item for a support, a tank support, generally most of the options aren't great, um, but I'm going to go through them. The most generic one that most people go into is Thormel as the, the basically their third item. Now anti-heal um, did get kind of nerfed in a way, so Thormel no longer applies Grievous Wounds when you crowd control people, but the base, the Bramble Vest is the first thing that you're going to be picking up, is, and it means anyone that auto attacks you takes 6 damage, which is nothing, um, but they also will get the 40% Grievous Wounds debuff of 3 seconds, so... If you know that they've got a lot of auto attackers and healers on the enemy team, um, basically primarily the auto attackers make it like if they're actually going to hit you, they will get that Grievous Wounds debuff and mitigate a lot of healing. So if there is a lot of healing on the enemy team, you're probably still going to want to lean towards that Bramble Vest and then going into the Thorn Mill. Other options, if they haven't got a lot of healing, generally you're just dealing with what kind of damage that the enemy team has and that you're mitigating it. So you're pressing tab, you're looking at seeing what on the enemy team is strong. Are they armored, like are they physical damage or are they magical damage? If you're not sure, you can go click on the champion and see how much attack damage they have or ability power. If their ability power is near zero, it's guaranteed that their, that their damage output is gonna be physical. Um, so if they have a, like a higher than like 100 AP on the AP window, which is that little kind of blue uh, purpley bolt, you can see it next to my portrait as it's got five right now. Um, if that number is like into entering into the triple digits or higher, it means they're going to be ability power based and they're going to do magic damage. Now my favorite magic resist items are uh, force of nature. 
pretty expensive, but it gives you movement speed and basically means that you end up reducing a lot of magic damage. Four Star Nature is a really good item. Alternatively, if you've also got a good amount of magic damage on your team, I really like taking Abyssal Mask. No one really ends up taking it, but uh, I think this is actually a secret OP item. Abyssal Mask, if you don't know what that does, it basically means that we can pick it up here. It puts a curse uh, on any enemy champions near you. So this this blue circle around me right now is how close you have to be for it to apply. And you start stripping away ba baseline magic resist away from opponents. When you get more HP, this scales up higher. This actually gets to around about 20-ish uh, when I hit like, so this actually put our level up to around about like level 13, which would be roughly the same time as you picking up this item potentially. Um, so you can see reducing magic resist by about 14, we would get more health with our relic shield once that's fully upgraded as well. So it does end up ending the ring more like the the 14, it's more like the 17-ish to 20 mark later on into the game. So Abyssal Mask reduces a lot of magic resist um, on the enemy team. Also, you get magic resist for each enemy cursed as well, and that stacks up pretty high as well. So 5 times 9 is 45. I hope my maths is fine. Uh, so on this item, you could get a total of a bonus of 85 magic resistance, which is actually absurdly crazy. So this item is really, really good at enhancing your um, team's magic damage, but also mitigating the amount of magic damage that the enemy team does to you as well. In terms of like physical damage blocking, once again we could mention the Thorn Mail, that does provide you with a lot of armor and that Grievous Runes debuff. But what if they do a lot of armor damage and they don't do a lot of healing? Then you've got a couple of options here too, with the Randuin's Omen and the Frozen Frozen Heart. Frozen Heart is really good against auto-attacking champions, champions like Master Yi, any kind of AD carries that want to auto-attack a lot. Same kind of thing as like the Abyssal Mask, you kind of need to be near people, but it does reduce their attack speed by 20% and give you a lot of armor. Alternatively, you could go into Randuin's Omen, it's kind of like a sort of the same thing along the same lines as um, the Frozen Heart, but it has an active. Um, it's quite a small little circle, but it does slow nearby enemies. Um, not their attack speed, but their movement speed by 55%. And also all critical strikes against you deal 20% less damage. So it can keep you alive a little bit longer. But generically for a game, you're probably going to be ending up with the four mail just to reduce Grievous Swoons. If you're never ever not sure, especially like if you're a new player, it can be pretty overwhelming. I recommend just sticking with the items that I've got on my inventory, the locket, the four mail, and the plated steel caps that gives you a lot of extra armor and your magic resistance is still quite it's okay at 48 percent just do note the enemy team will probably have some sort of magic penetration slash uh, percentage penetration so you probably will be around about like 25 percent reduced magic damage which isn't terrible one thing as well I do want to mention since we've done quite in-depth uh, item kind of explanations, the locker of the Iron Solari has an on use. So if I press the number two on my keyboard, it's going to use that and it's going to give myself and any allies nearby a shield, but it does decay pretty quickly over 2.5 seconds. So ideally you're only using this to block um, AUE kind of stuff that is incoming the most basic example I can think of is blocking a Carthus ultimate and you can just pop it just before it lands down on everyone's head near you to block the most amount of damage possible. That is basically the item section kind of covered. If you do end up having like three items or if you're really, really poor and you can't afford a four mil and you're already heading towards level 13, then do go for the watchful wardstone. I explain this in every single support guide, but so I'll do the same here again for you now. So when you buy a Watchful Wardstone and you've completed your Relic Shield quest, getting all the way up to 1000 gold, um, you're basically able to make this Watchful Wardstone automatically convert into a Vigilant Wardstone once you hit level 13. So every single support should have easily have completed their Relic Shield support quest by level 13. So you can pick up the Watchful Wardstone before you hit level 13 and it will automatically convert in your inventory once you hit level 13. 
And this item does a few things. Firstly, it only costs 1,100 gold, so it's really, really cheap. Once it converts into Vigilant Wardstone, it counts as a legendary item. So in terms of the locket's case, it's going to give your allies two extra armor and magic resistance with that aura. Now, Vigilant Wardstone also has base HP and ability haste, which is quite nice. But the Blessing of Ixtal increases your ability power, ability haste, attack damage and bonus health by an additional 12%. So we're basically going to be affecting the haste and our health by a considerable amount just from buying this item. Also, any control wards that we purchase get stored automatically into this item. So you can see in the bottom right hand corner, the store number three. Uh, that's three control wards stored inside my watchful wardstone. So if we use them here, you can see them being put down. And the good thing though is once you have this item comp completed into the Vigilant Wardstone, it will allow you to have an additional control ward uh, and an additional stealth ward on the map at the same time. So normally you would only be able to have three stealth wards, so that would be like your normal wards coming from your relic shield or in you know or from your trinket so you, you know you can have like three of those stealth wards up at one time well if you have the vigilant wardstone um you can have four of those stealth wards on the map at one point and you can have two control wards up at the same time unfortunately i can't showcase this right now because i'm not i haven't completed my relic shield but i am level 13. So that's a really good way, like if you also extract for cash, this also could be a very standard kind of support, tank support build where you literally just have boots, um, your locket and a watchful wardstone. You could also end up having something like the bramble as well for grievous wounds. So this loadout here could actually be your loadout in many games of League of Legends, honestly. Um, so yeah. All right, next we're going to be talking about the abilities that Nautilus has. Um, he's definitely one of the more, uh, he's probably the e intermediate um, kind of hook champion that you have. There's kind of like three hook champions in League. You've got Blitzcrank, Nautilus, and Thresh. We're obviously playing Nautilus right now. And uh, Blitzcrank is the easiest, Nautilus is the next highest, and then Thresh is the hardest. So, if you're familiar with hook champions already, um, this will probably be quite easy, easier transition into. Um, so I'll do my best to explain everything as easy as possible. So Nautilus passive is staggering blow. Nautilus's first auto attack against a target deals physical damage and roots them. The root duration goes up based on your champion level. So if we go up to this target dummy, this also affects minions as well, by the way. So you whack the auto hit um, and it roots the target in place. Now those kind of glacial kind of lines came out there because I immobilized the target and then glacial augment got used and put down, down the extra like slow tracks on the ground. But now my glacial augment's on cooldown. If I auto attack the training dummy, you see the target gets rooted and you can see that depleting circle means if I were to auto attack that target again, it means they wouldn't get rooted. So if I do more attacks here, I'm not actually rooting the target. The animation is slightly different um, for the root versus just auto attacks onto a rooted target that, well, onto a target that has been rooted recently. He kind of does like an overhead swing with his anchor. So the root cooldown hasn't got that long of a time, um, so it can't affect the same target more than once every six seconds. Um, but there is no cooldown switching targets, so you can bounce your cooldown um, on multiple different champions in one fight. So you can root that target, then you can root this one, do some whatever, do a dance if you want to, and then go back to rooting the first target and then rooting the second target. Pretty nice passive, honestly, and the extra burst of damage is pretty nice as well. It's pretty generous in terms of the, the actual war damage that comes out. Next, we are going to be talking about Nautilus's Q, his hook. Now, his hook has two properties. Um, the basic one is hooking an enemy champion. Kind of two things happen. You kind of go towards the enemy, but they also come towards you. So you're pulling them to you, but you're also heading into them at the same time. 
So if you're used to playing something like Blitzcrank, Blitzcrank pulls the target straight to you and Blitzcrank doesn't move. Nautilus, on the other hand, moves towards the target while the target is in the air. And you kind of meet at that halfway point. Now this ability does damage and you're also able to use other abilities while doing this Q animation, but I'll talk about that more in the advanced section later. And obviously it procs the glacial augment with your Q because you're immobilizing the target. There's a second element to this as well. If you end up hooking terrain, so unlike Blitzcrank hook where Blitzcrank's hook goes through terrain, Nautilus hook does not. But if he hooks terrain, whether it's a turret or a wall, let me get some more cooldown reduction. So you can actually drag yourself to the terrain. Now this does one of two th well, things. It basically reduces the cooldown also by 50% and also reduces the, cool, uh, the mana cost of the ability by 50% as well. So one thing that you're going to be doing is when you're coming out of base, you're actually going to be using your hook to get back into lane a bit quicker. So you can see how you can just use your hook to actually get into lane a bit quicker and it's only going to cost you about 30 mana per hook. So basically it doesn't really cost any mana whatsoever and you can use that to get around the map. But the downside is, is that you can't use it through terrain like Thresh and Blitzcrank. But you can do some tricks with this as well in order to get out of some crowd control effects which I have a video set up for in the advanced section later on. Now Nautilus's W is pretty interesting. On base value uh, it's a shield. It's a chunky little shield um, you know and shield will reduce damage that you take you know it's just some you know if you're blocking a, a big skill shot then it might be worth popping. But the cool thing with this ability is that it does da basically enhances your damage um, by a decent chunk and it makes that the damage is AoE. So if we pop our W and start auto hitting this target dummy, we're doing basically enhanced magic damage to this target, but also to any targets next to it. So let's bring it. The range is quite small. Uh, it's usually quite effective at like helping clear out minion waves. But you can see how this other target dummy is taking damage as well. So 16, 16, some damage here and there from the extra attacks. But the real kind of um, thing that from this ability, so it gives you a shield, make, enhances the damage of your auto attacks, but it's actually an auto attack cancel. Basically, it resets your auto attack. So, you know, Nautilus's auto attacks are very slow. But if we do auto W auto, auto w auto you can see how basically it's kind of halved the animation of the secondary auto attack and that can be pretty powerful for a couple of different scenarios um, one is clearing out wards and it makes it so you can clear out wards a lot quicker but also the main one is like being able to root multiple different targets in a team fight so i want to root these two target dummies as quickly as possible so auto attack one w to auto attack so auto attack W, auto attack, and it makes it so much quicker. You can see the difference. I'm going to not use my W here to auto attack reset. So auto, auto, but we could do with the W, we can do auto W, auto, and it kind of cuts it in half. And then it means that both of those champions are then rooted. So really, really nice way to getting roots very quickly on multiple different targets that are in the Next we have Nautilus's E. Now this ability is pretty weird, um, but basically it does three kind of AOE circles around you, um, and it does damage and it slows any enemies nearby. Um, if the enemy gets hit by more than one wave, the damage is reduced by 50%, but the burst damage from this ability is quite nice. It isn't that bad at all. You can intertwine that with your other abilities and things that basically you're going to be using this as soon as you engage essentially to slow down the target and just maybe get some extra burst damage on. Um, so generally the damage itself is kind of okay. It's just, you can see like if you're doing it further away, the target's going to get hit by more of those riptides. If you're doing it directly onto them, 
they're only kind of getting hit by one of those riptides. We're going to kind of cover that again in the advanced section of how you can get the most damage properly out of your E. Um, but it's not a huge thing that you need to necessarily worry about, if I'm completely honest. Nautilus's ultimate is where things get really spicy. So Nautilus ulti is a point and click and it will follow the target no matter what. So what happens here is that if we just do it on the front dummy here at the front as a point and click, it's a depth charge goes under the ground and then knocks up the target and any targets nearby. But the cool thing is if that target runs away, so say if we like alt this target, dummy at the very back the depth charge actually does like a mini knock up on any targets that it's going through so you see that that depth charge knocked up those two front minions or the two front champions even even though I targeted the one at the back so it's actually quite a lot of crowd control potential there if you're able to go for a target that's further away and like with other champions in between them um, so the damage uh, itself is very, it's fairly reasonable, but the really cool thing is, is that the stun duration goes up on that uh, targets, uh, on all of the targets that actually get hit by the depth charge, they also get stunned, which means that they can't really do too much uh, in terms of actually getting out of the knock up animation either. So it means they're definitely kind of like pinned in that situation. Also, it makes it super obvious where that person is going to be and it allows your team to land uh, follow up abilities quite easily as well because the knock up does last quite a long time. So say for example, you're just, you know, ulting an AD carry at the back line, you can see how easy it would be to then potentially follow up on any kind of abilities or, you know, long range attacks to try and get that person down as quickly as possible. Um, basically, if you've been, managed to follow all of that, every single one of Norse's ability has crowd control, including the W if you count that as an auto attack reset to enable your passive. So every single one of Norse's abilities is pretty important um, and also just means that you do a massive amount of crowd control in team fights in those burst moments. Okay. There is that cooldown on your passive for six seconds and you're going to have cooldown on your Q and, and stuff. So once you go in, you're going to have a little bit of downtime, but that's when you're kind of using your auto attacks to root as many different people as possible until your kind of hook comes back up and then you can do like another kind of crowd control play. We'll talk about combos in a second. I'm just going to talk about the ability skill order right now. So for Nautilus, you're always going to want to max your Q. Q is your like bread and butter. Putting points in Q reduces the cooldown, increases the damage, and means you can just engage and do more things in team fights. Now, in terms of maxing second, it's fairly balanced in terms of win rates, which one you want to take. But generally, I would advise taking W second. The main reasoning behind that is because the max, the shield basically increases dramatically um, as you put more points in, going from 8% of your maximum health to 12%. And as you're progressing through the game, you're going to have a lot of HP. Um, being on, you're going to have the relic shield complete. So you, you will probably be on around about 2.5k HP um, with the shield. So that's going to be quite a good chunk. Plus there's a base number on that as well. So your shield will be roughly blocking around about 370-ish damage. And it's on a relatively low cooldown. If you're wanting some extra uh, like damage and a uh, movement speed slow, then the Riptide is still a viable option. And you may want to try that on your a couple of your games just to see how that goes. But for the your very first few games, I'd advise you to max the W second. So we'll max E last here. Let me level up to max level. And then you're going to want to take your ultimate at 6, 11, and 16 whenever those become available to you. Okay, next we're going to be talking about some advanced things that you can do in the laning phase with Nautilus, including talking about things like mini dematerializer um, and getting out of some pesky situations with your hook. 
So let's put down some target dummies. Give ourselves an AD carry, even though we can't really interact with any AD carries with our kit. So standard 2v2 in the bot lane. Early on, you have great kill potential. Straight from level 1, your hook is really good, your passive is really good, and your baseline damage is really good. Um, so the only thing is that would pre necessarily prevent you from looking from a level 1 engage is your AD carry. Now it depends on what your AD carry is and some basic AD carry knowledge is important but if you're playing with a hard engage something like a Draven um, and maybe if the enemy team has kind of grossly misstepped maybe that someone's here and you can do a nice hook like this with an auto attack route to follow up and then you can whack down the ignite. If your AD carry is able to follow that up on pretty much any enchanter you're going to get a flash reaction from their enemy support almost guaranteed. So Nautilus is really, really good at catching out a single individual and pinning them down and trying to make, basically trying to kill them. If you're up against another tank matchup, that's when it's going to be a lot more awkward because usually in tank v tank matchups, say if you're up against the Leona or like a Blitzcrank, whoever goes in first can generally lose. Because say for example, Blitzcrank goes in for a hook on you, you have two options. You can stand in front of your AD carry and block the hook and then as the hook lands onto you, you can queue onto terrain and because you queued onto terrain, you will take the damage from the hook itself but you'll block the actual crowd control so it means your AD carry doesn't get hooked. And because you hooked it on terrain, it means the cooldown on your hook will be a 50% off on the cooldown and also Nautilus's hook is on a greater, is on a much lower cooldown than Blitzcrank's hook. So that means you can look for a counter engage pretty much near immediately after doing that terrain kind of like hack, almost I want to call it, uh, to basically get out of that Blitzcrank hook. So that's just an example of like, you know, if Blitzcrank goes in, he can probably screw himself over by making that first engage, but the same with like vice versa as well. Because if you look to go in, say if you go in, the Blitzcrank could potentially then hook in your AD carry um, and it could end up being a bit of a bad situation in that part. Um, also, if there's an enemy jungle coming down, you kind of like overextended your position to make it really, really hard for you to then get away since your hook's going to be on a longer cooldown because it wasn't used on terrain, it was used on an enemy player. So going into tank v tank matchups, usually it's just kind of both tanks kind of like like nodding each other a little bit. That's not to say you can't make a kill play, but it's much more difficult in those tank v tank matchups. Mages are similar to enchanters, like if you're going up against the brand, you can definitely look to go for an early engage. Mages, mages like Zyra and um, brand are very, very squishy and Lux. So if you're able to actually hook them really early, you can maybe look for a very, very early kill onto them. As long as your AD carry is able to follow up. But going back to that kind of Blitzcrank hook example, where Blitzcrank kind of hooks you, and you can then use that on terrain. You can use that on quite a few different crowd control abilities uh, in the game in order to, even though you're kind of crowd controlled, because you're CC'd, but your hook is still going out on terrain, you're kind of then blocking, um, you, your hook is still forcing your model out of, towards where your hook is. Um, even though you're stunned or whatever, it still will allow you to do that. And I actually have a video that I made. Thank you, John, by the way, for uh, going into a practice mode for me uh, so I could showcase this to people. So this was uh, some footage I only took about 30 minutes ago. Okay, whenever, ready whenever you are. Wee. So you can see how that's kind of a little bit like kind of hackery. Um, but that does kind of like show you uh, how one example of how you can use Nautilus's hook to get out of some really weird situations. Um, and obviously then it puts your hook on cooldown only on like a few seconds because you hit that terrain. Uh, let me just close that. <laughs> um, so those are some kind of like laning phase kind of tricks that you can kind of do. I did say at the start in the rune section, I was going to teach you how to use Hextech Flash. So for that, I'm going to have to turn off auto refresh cooldowns and I'm going to have to flash. So if you flash, basically it will then automatically convert into something called Hex Flash. Now there's a lot of people that ask me a lot when I use this, when I 
particularly when I'm streaming. Like, how do you use hex flash? Now, it's not like normal flash. Um, you have to be out of combat to do it. If you get hit by an enemy champion, it will go back on that little 20 second cooldown timer. Um, and basically what you want to do is you want to hold down the button and then it will basically open up a little circle around you and a dot. The longer you hold down the hex flash button, the further the dot will go up to the maximum amount, and then you will essentially flash. It's basically a channeled delayed flash. But if you're hiding in a brush like this, for example, you know you've got a control on so they can't see you, you still have a lot of pressure even though you don't have flash. And you can change the direction that you're going in at the last second if you decide you don't want to go in. So I'm holding down my F button, which is associated for my flash, bringing up the circle, then I'm going to let it go or just let the channel like carry out. And essentially I'm just doing a flash. So you can let go of it earlier to do the flash sooner, or you can let the flash just do the whole duration and then you kind of launch out. You can change your mind at the last second by moving your cursor. So wherever your cursor is, you can you're, that's where you're going to go. So I can change at the last second um, to, you know, if I suddenly see the enemy jungler coming down, I'm not going to want to go flashing into this situation. This is primarily used only in the laning phase though. It's very difficult to do this in the mid game onwards and there's basically a way for you to get a lot of laning phase pressure even when your flash is on cooldown. So that's how you use that. Uh, another rune I said or maybe briefly mentioned is the minion dematerializer. I know it's going to be a little bit weird to use, but as soon as long as you have your AD carry near you when you're using this item on like the cannon minion, ideally, um, it's going to basically after like one second, it's going to kill that minion instantly. So let me just do, I can actually show you if I spawn the minions and then teleport to the enemy's base. Right, I've already missed the minions. All right. So this is an Akana minion. Ideally, you'd want to use this in a Akana minion. I'm going to press my number five on this caster minion. You see, after a short delay, it just gulps the minion. It doesn't matter. It does like 99999 damage to the minion um, and uh, it just dies. Um, but you do that on the cannon minion and you will get the gold. And also your AD carry will get the gold as long as you've got one of these relic shield like the little blue balls following you, uh, your AD carry will get the cannon minion. Now a really, really, really good way to use minion dematerializer is when you're looking to push in the wave and then recall. So say, for example, both teams are kind of low HP, no one's going to really want to engage, both teams are looking to disengage. You can get your team and your, you and your AD carry basically back to fountain quicker. But as soon as this cannon minion comes down into the lane, you use mini dematerialize on it. You finish it, kill off these cast, uh, well, the, the melee minions and the casting minions as quickly as possible. And then you can head back into base. Uh, basically, it means that the enemy team has a whole cannon minion to have to kill before they can recall. And a cannon minion can take a long time to kill, especially early in the game. We're talking around about like... I don't know, six or seven seconds of downtime having to deal with a chunky cannon minion and it's a right pain in the butt. Um, so when you can uh, just use the minion dematerialize just to get rid of that, that makes, you know, resetting the lane for yourselves super, super easy because by the time you've done, you've, you know, you've killed out that wave, you've eaten the cannon minion, you've then reset and recalled, you're already back in fountain and then the enemy team have only just started recalling and it allows you to reposition into the lane before your enemy and that can be a massive advantage in setting up wards, vision, clearing out any enemy control wards really really quickly especially with that auto attack reset that you have in your W by doing auto W auto just help clear those those wards out a bit quicker um, so it gives you a better kind of like you know preparation for the lane than your opponent which can have it you know it can set the lane tone, it can set up brush advantage for more hex flash plays and stuff like that. Um, in terms of actual kind of combos or what you're going to be wanting to do in autos fight, uh, fights, we kind of briefly talked about, you know, using your W as an auto attack reset to land roots on as many different people as possible. Uh, but I did also briefly mention that you can use your Q and then use your abilities while you're flying in with your Q. The reason why I mention this is because I don't want you to mash everything down in one go. You need to be kind of steady and kind of 
layer your crowd control on one after the other because it's actually possible to do your hook, your passive, and your ulti all in one go and you're only getting about half the duration of the crowd control that you should be doing. So for example, if I do a very standard combo that done correctly would be hook onto the enemy champion, then auto attacking, and then using your ultimate. That is how you're getting the most amount of crowd control on that target to make it a right pain in the butt for the enemy to have to deal with. What you don't want to do, let me get my cooldowns back, is you, you don't want to like do your Q and your ulti instantly like when you're in the air because if you manage to do that um, then it basically means that you're not layering your crowd control properly and if you're kind of unlucky as well you can do your auto attack maybe a little bit too soon as well so it depends on how much you want to use your glacial augment on the ground it depends if the en enemy has flash as well because if the enemy has flash they might have a bit more urgency in terms of, so you see how like there are kind of counts with my, uh, my ultimate and my Q. You might have to rewind that back slightly. But you, that's not layering it properly. But in some situations where the enemy has flash, you might want to make sure you get your auto attack off as quickly as possible. And then do your ultimate. A slightly more ever so more advanced combination would be weaving in an auto attack reset at the same time. And also making sure you get your E in. So we're going to be doing... Q to hook in, auto attack, W auto attack, E during this as well to get the extra damage and slowing, and then chucking an ultimate down. So that full combo kind of looks something like this. Q, auto, W, auto. I cancelled my auto because I'm an idiot, but you can kind of see the gist of where that was going. I can show you one more time. So Q, auto, W, auto, and then it's like E into ulti. Done a slightly bit faster. And obviously whacking on your ignite um, whenever you have that available to you. Um, other than that, um, you can kind of fly in with your E as well like that. That's how you get the most amount of damage on Nautilus. It's not vital that you remember to do this every single time. But if you remember from the ability section, if you're standing on top of your opponent and doing your E, they're only getting hit one instance of Riptide. Whereas if you're standing like from this kind of range, they still only get hit by one, but if you're a bit nearer, they can get hit by multiple distances. So if you're standing not on the edge and not on top of them, it's kind of like a sweet spot in the halfway where they can get hit by like multiple instances of your E. And that kind of happens when you're flying in with your Q. So if you do Q and then do your E like that, they're actually getting hit by multiple instances of your E, but also because you're kind of like jank moving them as well you can sometimes get a third proc on as well so that's how you basically get the most amount of damage with nautilus is by doing your q as you're flying in the air activating your e and then doing the you know auto w auto uh, and then chucking down your ulti uh, at some point uh, just before that root duration ends to make sure they can't get away but that is like the mega combo of Nautilus. Um, and that would be take you some games to get used to. So E, E as you're flying, uh, Q, and then E as you're flying in. Auto, W, Auto, and then all team. And Ignite as well during all of that. If you're able to and have it. Um, other than that, I don't feel like there's anything else needed to talk about this champion. I think I've pretty much covered everything and I'm pretty happy with the information that I've kind of given you. I hope that the combo descriptions weren't too kind of confusing. Um, but don't kind of like, the, the main thing I want you to take in is just take your time pacing. Once you do your hook, do your auto attack, then do your ultimate. Um, so make sure that pacing is kind of there. Also, it's perfectly fine to engage with your ultimate as well, particularly on a squishy target. Just do note they are able to flash away from your ultimate while that is going on. So um, it will still go for them and hunt them down. And then once you can finally get into range, you can then hook them, then auto and then W auto to kind of reset that. 
and obviously track down your Ian and the Ignite. You're just wanting to get the kill on them as quickly as possible. And then while you are waiting for cooldowns, you're looking just to kind of root anyone else while you can. Or just bashing more auto attacks onto the same target that you were hitting in the first place. Just to be annoying. But yeah, apart from that, I think I'm happy with that. I hope you guys enjoyed the Norse's support guide. As mentioned at the start of the video, I have other support guides for other support champions, including you know, Lux, Morgana, Rakan, Milio. We've done loads already, and we've still got loads more to cover. So be sure to subscribe, like the video. If you have any questions, feel free to comment or ask me on discord.gg slash Bizzleberry. I will reply or someone else in the community will, will reply. We've got around about 2,000 to 3,000 support players on the server, and usually most of the berries are helpful and uh, willing to help out. So thank you to all the berries in the Discord. Just do make sure if you do join the Discord, make sure you verify. Uh, it's an anti-bot process to make sure that botters don't get onto the server. Or you can ask me the question if I'm live streaming on twitch.tv slash bizzleberry. So you can ask me any questions there as well. All the best. I hope you guys found this guide useful and um, I will be doing another guide in the very near future, probably tomorrow, the next day after this video is up. So be on the lookout for that one. All the best. Take care and see you for another video very soon.